we're going to start by uh, just introducing ourselves and, and having a little dialogue. And uh, uh, we'll begin by just um, sort of situating this. I'm a psychologist and a neuroscientist by training. And in the very early part of my career, uh, I was motivated by uh, a particular question, which is why are some people more vulnerable to life's challenges and why are others more resilient and uh, enabled to uh, uh, have higher levels of well-being and how can we use strategies to help people uh, move along a continuum toward increased well-being and that led me to uh, uh, the encounter with the contemplative traditions and uh, this was many, many years ago, and I started uh, as a graduate student at Harvard in the 1970s and was blessed at that time to meet a few people whose presence and demeanor really exemplified very high levels of well-being. And um, uh, I found out that they all had in common an interest in and a practice of meditation. And so that led me to go off uh, to India as a uh, after my second year of graduate school to see if I can uncover anything about this tradition that um, uh, would make sense in the scientific arena. And I came back after spending three months in Asia with a fervent aspiration to do research uh, on meditation and uh, uh, related kinds of practices. But it was made very clear to me by the faculty at Harvard at that time that if I wanted a successful career in science, this was a terrible way to begin. Um, and so uh, uh, I needed to find something else. And so I actually, uh, we published a few papers early on on meditation way back, which are um, not cited at all these days, but in the 19, late 1970s and early 1980s, if you go back, you'll find a few. Um, uh, and then it lied dormant, and as I often say, uh, I became a closet meditator, and I had my own practice, but really didn't say much about it publicly, uh, and um, uh, it was very much in the background. And then that all changed in 1992 when I first met His Holiness the Dalai Lama, and uh, His Holiness the Dalai Lama challenged me, and uh, said that you're using tools of modern neuroscience to study anxiety and depression and fear. Why can't those same tools be used to study virtuous qualities, qualities like kindness and compassion? And I didn't have a very good answer for His Holiness other than that it's hard, but when we first began to study uh, adversity and this sort of negative qualities, destructive emotions, that was hard too. Uh, and I think most scientists would agree that we've made a considerable amount of progress. And so one of the things that His Holiness the Dalai Lama encouraged us to do is to start studying these things. And um, it became clear very early on that one of the best ways to start was to bring experts into the laboratory who uh, had spent years training their mind. And this brings us to Mingyur Rinpoche. Um, Mingyur Rinpoche was one of the very first practitioners uh, to come into our lab. And the very first time I met Rinpoche was in the Dane County Airport uh, in Madison, Wisconsin. I think in either, uh, I was trying to remember either the um, late of fall of 2001 or spring of 2000. Uh, first time is in Dharamsala. Oh, in Dharamsala, yes, in, at, uh, at the Mind and Life meeting. Mind and Life meeting. Yeah. So it's 2000, no, 1990. Ni that was 1995, <coughs> uh, 2000. Emotion. Destructive emotions. 2000? Yeah, I think ah, yeah. it was 2000. 2000 yeah. yeah, 2000. Uh, and then Rinpoche came to our lab uh, in 2001 or 2002, and uh, that really was the beginning. And uh, the paper, the scientific paper that uh, was the first scientific paper on our studies of long-term practitioners was published in 2004. And one of the co-authors of that paper was Mathieu Ricard. Um, probably many of you have heard of Mathieu Ricard. He is a Tibetan Buddhist monk, French by nationality. Uh, 
Uh, and he's been a Buddhist monk since 1967, but Mathieu also has a PhD in molecular biology. Uh, he worked with Francois Jacob uh, at the Pasteur Institute. Uh, Francois Jacob was a Nobel laureate. And so um, Mathieu came to the table with really remarkable credentials. And the paper that we wrote in 2004 had Mathieu as a co-author, and there were eight uh, long-term meditation practitioners that were featured in that paper, whose data were featured, and Mingyur Rinpoche was one of those eight practitioners. Uh, and um, uh, we started with these very long-term practitioners to see if our measures, the tools that we had available to us, can actually see a difference. Because if we didn't see a difference with very long-term practitioners, it was probably not going to be fruitful to study people at the early stages of practice. And sure enough, not only did we see a difference, but we saw a difference that was dramatic. Uh, and I'll say something more about that as we go along today. Uh, and so that was really the beginning of um, this new era in contemplative neuroscience or contemplative science. And um, one of the primary motivations for doing this work is that in Western culture today, science occupies a privileged position and uh, uh, a lot of sectors of our culture demand evidence before they are willing to embrace certain practices. We know that medicine is becoming more evidence-based. We know that education is becoming more evidence-based. Uh, and so uh, the uh, accrual of scientific data that is showing us how these simple contemplative practices can help to change the, the mind, the brain, the body in ways that promote our well-being has, I think, really been uh, helpful in bringing this to wider sectors of the culture. And certainly, I think Jim and I share a conviction that um, having centers like CCARE uh, on major university campuses uh, is helpful in uh, calling attention to the importance of this work and enabling it to penetrate into multiple sectors of our culture. Uh, and, um, uh, and so uh, Rinpoche and I have begun a dialogue and collaboration around these issues that began early on and uh, one of the things that has been so um, meaningful to me about Rinpoche's work is that in addition to being a Buddhist teacher, uh, Rinpoche has also taken some of the key elements in his tradition and have made them extraordinarily accessible uh, in a program that is uh, a secular program. Uh, that Jim mentioned that was articulated in his book, The Joy of Living. And um, uh, people often ask me who have not been associated with this, um, what's a book I should read about meditation? And the first recommendation I always give them is The Joy of Living. Uh, so if, if you have not had much contact with this and want a great introduction, uh, it really is extraordinarily accessible and also brings in um, some of the scientific research. Uh, and this Joy of Living program, I think, has the potential of uh, a very wide reach because it is secular. It can be done by anyone with any religious conviction or individuals who have no religious conviction. Uh, and so uh, I have been... Um, extremely uh, interested in that and uh, one of my aspirations uh, in the near future is to begin to do research with the Joy of Living program in a way that uh, has been done, for example, with mindfulness-based stress reduction, uh, which uh, has also been, uh, I think, a helpful addition to the armamentarian of mindfulness-based uh, interventions that have been used in a wide variety of settings. 